Welcome to the Suburban Artistry Dark Room. Today we're going to talk about how we set up our own dark room in an apartment that we rent. That means we're low on space and we can't make a lot of changes to the building itself. We need to get our security deposit back. We're also going to talk about the bare minimum that you need to get started in your own dark room and what kind of little toys might be a little bit helpful to upgrade to. Let's get started. Papers on the mirrors to help make it easier to see this video. Here's an overview of what we're going to be talking about. Making your room dark. The dry area of the dark room for your enlarger safe light and paper cutter. Some space in between your dry and wet areas are best where your chemicals are going to be, washing, and drying. First, we're gonna talk about how to keep the room completely dark. For us, the biggest problem was this door here, light getting through the cracks. So this is a blackout curtain that I purchased from Target and there is Velcro, and there's also Velcro that is attached on the sides of the door. These side pieces are intentionally past the edge of the door, so that way the cloth would have to wrap around the sides. To hang it, I just match up the top left corner, and then match up the Velcro bits on the sides. If I need to be coming in and out of the door, I can actually pull this part back and I can open the door a small degree so I can get in and out. The bottom of the blackout curtain is a couple inches longer than the door itself and that allows the fabric to lie really flat down there and then light can't come through the bottom. If you're still worried about it, you could always roll up a towel and kind of shove it into the crack. This is our paper cutting station. We actually had to cover up a sink so that we had some more usable space and this has actually worked really nicely. If you want to go the bare minimum, you can just use uh, scissors and ruler for most of what you would need. But I find, especially in the dark room where you are working with very limited light, it's really nice to have a dedicated paper cutter. This style paper cutter comes in at around $25 starting price on Amazon. If you don't have this extra counter space available, you could actually do this right underneath your enlarger and just move the stuff underneath when you don't need it. The most important thing for your dark room is your enlarger. So here's our Bessler, and that was a dust covering. We deal with both dust and animal fur, and that makes it so we don't have to clean it quite so often. This particular enlarger was purchased from an art thrift store called Recreative in Denver. This was a really awesome find. For only $50, I got a functioning enlarger with the easel, grain focuser, and a bunch of other tools, as well as the lenses. It really pays off to look around at different places that sell used items. If this isn't an option for you, then Intrepid also sells an enlarger kit which is much cheaper than trying to get one of these enlargers brand new. The enlarger here is connected to the timer. You're definitely gonna want a timer. It is impossible to manage your own times. Human reactions just aren't quick enough. You can get a mechanical one or a digital one like this one. I personally have had a lot more success with the digital ones. I found this one at another place that sells used photo items. That was Camera Trader. I got this baby for just $30. My mechanical ones were great, except they eventually wore down and became less accurate. 
This one right off the bat has even decimals that you can work with. My enlarger connects over here and then over here is the plug for my safe lights. For my safe light, I have a nice cheap option as well. So this is just an old lamp that I had around and what I have inside is a safe light bulb. This safe light bulb only costs four or five dollars from Freestyle Photo. Let me show you what that looks like in the dark. I have not had to replace this bulb. It has worked wonderfully for me. The camera doesn't really do justice to actually how bright and workable it is in here. But if we wanted to, we could always add a second light to this other side of the dark room. As you can see, everything is pretty readable. I also wanted to mention a few other necessities for your dark room. This is an easel, and these ones can be expensive, but you could get lucky and find a used one for a really good price. If you need to go bare minimum and inexpensive, you could also get some mat board that has a window cut out of it that you would tape directly onto the surface beneath your enlarger. And it would work the same way it would open and close and it would need to be cut specifically to the size that you are using for your photo paper. The other thing that you need is filters. Putting filters into your enlarger is going to make sure that you have the ability to adjust the contrast. Some enlargers will have something built into it. This one does not. Of course, you will need some photo paper. RC paper is going to be a really good paper to get started with. You'll want some sort of timer that works well in the dark room. This timer does not emit any light and I got it from the dollar store. And then finally, you'll need some sort of permanent marker so that way you can write on the back of your photo paper and make notes. That way you know what you did so you can make adjustments from there. We needed some more space to have our trays of chemicals, so we got this table from Sam's Club. It extends to be really tall, about waist height, and here's this side completely extended. What's pretty cool is that if this part's only partially extended, it sits on top of the toilet and is perfectly level on top. Some people will just put their trays directly into their bathtub or their shower. This would be an okay option if you don't take baths and you shower instead. I didn't want to have any of those chemicals possibly still in the water that I bathe in. I've set up the table to the alternate configuration that works for this room. So I can extend both legs fully have it over the toilet, bridging to both sides, and one side is resting into the bathtub. This works well for my smaller trays, but not so much for the bigger trays because that hose needs to go across the room and I would be reaching over into the bathtub area. It does make the bathroom feel quite a bit bigger though. My chemical trays were another purchase from Camera Trader. These three cost me $5 altogether, and these were actually exactly what I wanted. These are by Yankee. I love these ones because they are actually angled at the top, so I feel like I can actually get the tray to the same size as my paper so I don't have to mix up a bunch of extra chemicals to make sure it fills enough of the tray and because of the angled sides, I can still reach in and get out my paper without too much trouble. If you can't find used trays, they are available online and are fairly reasonable, especially for the smaller sizes. I have also seen people use other things made out of plastic or metal for their chemicals, such as cat litter trays, 
and it does work, but you probably need to use more chemicals to fill up your tray. For health reasons, you really should use some tongs. These ones have a nice soft tip on them so they won't damage your paper. These are your cheaper options, the bamboo. They are a little clumsy to use. If you have a little extra money to spend, then I would recommend getting these metal ones. You can see that they're naturally wanting to stay closed. That means it's much easier to get it into your tray, grab your paper, and lift it up. You don't have to clench it the whole time. These ones I got from Freestyle Photo for something like $30. They were expensive, but totally worth it. Technically, you only need a developer and a fixer to make a successful print, but it is helpful to have a stop in between. If you don't use stop to completely deactivate your developer, then you at least can use some water and that will help your fixer last a lot longer. When we're done with our chemicals, we pour them back into our bottles and then put them underneath the cupboard for storage to stay out of the light. Here's how we wash our prints. We actually connect up this rapid washer. This came from b &H Photo. I could use another tray and just rinse and dump in the sink, but this really works out very nicely because I can let prints rinse off while I'm doing my next photograph. And it only takes about two minutes for each print to rinse off. There are little holes up here where the water comes out and little holes on the opposite ends where the water is going to leave. The water is going to flow over and under your photo to clean it of chemicals. We make sure to just angle this a little bit and push it over the sink so that way we get some nice flow into the sink and none of it gets back onto the counter. What we have here is in between a splitter and all it does is screws on and you just want to make sure to have a little bit of that plumber's tape wrapped around so it doesn't leak. This position here allows the water to come through the shower head when the shower is turned on. And then if you switch it this way, then the water is gonna come through the hose and go over to our washer. The reason we had to do this is because the faucet here in the apartment, this piece doesn't screw out so we could attach the hose. We could have taken the faucet out but that would have been a lot more trouble. And really the hose coming from the shower head was the better solution for us. When we're done with the washer, we just pull this up. And then we have our shower caddy over here and we just loop our extra hose right over that. Now I'm gonna demonstrate how we dry things. Let me get this paper out of the way. So we're going to use the mirror here as a surface to squeegee against. Here is a squeegee. I got this from Dollar Tree and I made an inspection of it first. It's got a very straight edge and I tested it against my prints and it did not cause any scratches, even though they were wet and soft from soaking. So you simply take your prints, they're nice and wet at this point, you squeegee one side, squeegee the other side, and that gets the bulk of the water off. The squeegee just hangs off to the side. And then from there, I just need to hang it. What I've done here is to take a coat hanger and I've dangled some wire from it and then attached some wooden clothespins. I like these wooden clothespins because they do not scratch up my paper or my film. I've had issues with plastic clothespins. So there are these kind of hanging devices that you can buy, but since none of them have the wood attached to it, I figured I'd go ahead and make my own. 
I have two of these hangers that are attached to nails up here. And if I needed to, I could add more. They are hanging directly over the wash and the fix. So it's not gonna hurt anything when it happens to drip. I can also dry long bits of film. And then I just take one of my clothespins and clip it to the bottom so that way it weights it down so the film dries straight. When I'm done using the darkroom, everything gets packed away. Anything that shouldn't get dusty, as well as making sure that all of the chemicals from my trays or from my film are put into a dark spot. If you don't have cabinets, that'll work. You could get a dark colored bin with a lid and store all of your chemicals and things that need to stay clean inside of that. The table just folds down. And hangs out right here against the wall or on the wall outside of the bathroom. Now I've set up for developing film. And of course, you need it to be dark. Some people like to use a dark bag, but since I already have a dark room with that blackout curtain completely wrapping around the door, I know I'm good to put my film on the reels in here. Now remember, film is very sensitive and you wanna spend some time in your dark room just with the lights completely off and make sure that there's nothing in there that's going to create any light. We had a little switch over here that seemed to emit a little bit of light up here. So we have covered that with some gaff tape. Over here I have my setup for the chemicals. So I have some graduated cylinders and here are my chemicals. At a minimum, you need to have the developer and you need to have fixer but it's recommended that you also use Stop, Permawash, and PhotoFlow. You're gonna want a thermometer. We happen to use an electric thermometer just because we had an extra one hanging around after we got a new one. An analog thermometer would work just as well. We reuse our chemicals as much as possible, so we have funnels here to get our chemicals back in these bottles. So we mix up all of our chemicals ahead of time, get them in these smart water bottles, which is perfect for fitting a full liter of liquid into it, or the half works really nicely and you can actually squeeze out a lot of the air in the bottle. I would recommend that there's some water that is set aside as well that's to the correct temperature. If any of your temperatures vary, especially in the early stages, then you can get some problems showing up in your film. As you can see, it's pretty easy to create your own darkroom at home as long as you get a little bit creative. There are a lot of options out there that are pretty inexpensive. So hopefully this video encouraged you to create your own darkroom at home so you can start processing your own film and making your own prints. It's much more satisfying when you do it all yourself. So if you guys liked this video, please like and subscribe and see you all next time.